Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this EFLM seminar on the rational use of laboratory tests. I'm Mike Hall from the UK, and it's my privilege to moderate this webinar. At the end of the presentation, there will be the opportunity for questions. If you do have a specific question, as Daniel said, use the Q&A box in the middle of the screen, and we'll take as many as we can at the end of the presentation. As you'll be aware, I'm sure, there's been increasing global interest recently in the effective use of laboratory medicine. We know that laboratory testing is the single highest volume um, medical activity. And we also know that it's effect essential to the cl clinically cost-effective delivery of care. But as health economies throughout the world grapple with the shift from volume to value, from doing more things to doing things better, then laboratory medicines come under scrutiny to demonstrate that our, our testing is both effective uh, and being used effectively. As laboratory scientists, we work very hard to ensure that all the tests that we do are accurate and precise and sensitive and specific. But for them to really affect patient outcomes, we know that that's not enough. They need to be used in the right way on the right patients. And that need increases as tests become more complicated. The new Institute of Medicine report in the United States published last September emphasizes the need for physician education in the rational use of laboratory tests. And that's our theme for today, how we're going to use and improve the utilization of laboratory testing. Our distinguished speaker is Professor Gustav Kovac, who is chair of the Institute of Biochemistry, Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine at the Slovak Medical University in uh, Bratislava. He's also president of the Slovak Society of Laboratory Medicine and chair of the EFLM work group for Congresses on Postgraduate Education. He was the editor of a, a monograph on the uh, rational ordering of laboratory parameters published in Slovakia in 2015. And that describes how, uh, and he's going to describe in his presentation how that manuscript was developed and how it can be used to improve laboratory uh, utilization. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kovac to speak to you. Gustav. Thank you very much, and hello, everybody. And I will try to tell you a story about the rational use of laboratory tests in last two do or during last two years. That will be presented in five steps. I will try to describe the process, the resources, then results, discuss potential, of the results and make some reflections and at the end of that presentation. Uh, let me start with step one, the process. We started at the beginning of the year 213 and as two orders. And during four months, we develop a, a basic material or, or a first draft, which you see on here. Then followed the, the second step, the internal commenting. Nine, nine and other co-authors were invited, and as you see on this, uh, as you see on this picture, the process was quite conflicting and uh, the, and, and demanding. But at the end of the uh, this six-month process, we were able to present the result of our discussions and cooperation on the public panel discussion in November 213. And this picture shows that this process or, or this presentation was not so not so hard as uh, the step one. After that presentation, were several comments and proposals were discussed and and edit. All these comments and proposals has been in, uh, implemented in the next draft, which was uh, processed and and this process last six months, six another month, and uh, thereafter it was put on the table and discussed and went through by the team of co-authors, which was extended to four and other co-authors, and uh, one year thereafter, that means in November 200, 214, the final draft was presented to the expert public audience and uh, publicly, and 300 participants has presented at the panel discussion, 
and all from the field of clinics. Uh, there were also laboratorians and also people from health insurance companies. And at the beginning of 215, the monography was presented. These two photos symbolized that the process was not so simple as it would uh, or as it would see at the, at the first glance because this tie is so it is tie it is smoky and it is the, it is it is damaged and this glass has not only one but several openings so it is quite complicated it symbolizes the complication of that process so far to the, the step 1 and we are going to describe the resources. The first one is the model, or the mental model. We took the German handbook from Lothar Th Thomas, very good or very good known German professor of laboratory medicine. And this book has a story more than 20 years, five editions. And you see that at the beginning there have been 500 pages and 18 authors, and at the, at the end, uh, there has been 60 <coughs> authors and 100 and 1017 pages. And one uh, very important comment is that the quality it also demonstrates that of, of the book demonstrates that it uh, was translated into English, which is not obvious case from not uh, from not English books and distributed also in the United States. Now to the uh, authors. These are main four orders. At the left side, uh, these orders uh, prepared the first draft, and these orders were then uh, edit and or not edit, invited, and uh, they finalized the process. And in, be and in between, and you see all are medical doctors, specialists, three are specialists in internal medicine, and one is specialist in laboratory medicine, and uh, as you see here on this picture. And other orders are also medical doctors, specialists in diabetology, pediatrician, hematologist, also surgeon, and specialist in acute medicine. And the last group of orders, pediatrician and specialist in immunology at the same time, and also a PhD specialist in microbiology. Unfortunately, from uh, the endocrinologist, from the infectologist and geneticist, we have no photos, but I hope we will have them present for the next seminar. I will continue with the presentation of the results. I will try to describe the monography structure, the structure of chapters, and then the use of parameters. So you see that the monography has eight chapters from internal medicine through endocrinology, hematology, immunology, infections, extra visage, urgent cases, and molecular diagnostics. This is the left column, and in the right column you see the groups of parameters of diseases or categories, clusters, and uh, the philosophy is so that uh, each disease and adequate laboratory parameters are defined, or for each parameter, the adequate diseases, uh, adequate diseases are defined, both in which ordering is or indication of them is justified. Now to the structure of the content of uh, of chapters. Chapter one, internal medicine, has uh, parameters, and you see parameters of protein metabolism of organ damage and, and, and so on, and on the one hand, and also uh, some categories of diseases in which, like intoxication, in which uh, given parameter or indicated authorized parameters are uh, authorized. The second chapter is endocrine system. In this chapter, approach that diseases are defined and in the, in, in the diseases parameters are defined which are authorized and vice versa as well as parameters are given and in which uh, diseases are defined. So you see this mixed approach in this chapter. The first chapter is hematology, and in that chapter are defined parameters and then to, to then authorize diseases uh, edit. Chapter 
Fifth, immunology is quite holistic sketch because in that chapter there are parameters characterized for cell immunity, humoral immunity, and also projection to the diseases, and also interpretation is added. I think that this uh, chapter, immunology and allergology, is the, the best developed from all chapters. Infection diseases, mainly in this chapter, only diseases are given, and to, to their diseases, parameters are, are added, which are authorized. But these parameters were divided into a so-called general laboratory, which are used in each case, in, in fact, and then special laboratory parameters, which are used in special cases like bacterial infections, viral infections, and so on. There is also a chapter extra visit, and you see that bronchoalveolar leverage, cerebrospinal fluid, and synovia is given as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example of the structure of parameters, of, of the kind of parameters, and also other extra visits are added, but without examples. Chapter urgencies is special, because in, in the urgent situation, you have to do a, a clinical decision very quickly, and th this is the first kind of decision. And the second one is where the patient should be transported or given into which clinical ward. So you have available re relatively broad array of parameters as you, as you see here. At the final uh, chapter is molecular diagnostics, which has a educational uh, character and uh, because uh, at least in our country, molecular diagnostic is in the general practice, practice not known very good, so the people should have some basic information about that, and therefore there are some uh, informations about techniques used in molecular diagnostics about uh, and, and the fields in, re in, in which these diseases are, in which these parameters or techniques are, are used. So far to the structure of the, of the chapters. Now, what is the rational use of parameters? And I will show it on special examples. From the chapter, internal medicine, and from the parameters, protein metabolism, I show you uh, the parameter electrophoresis. And it is seen here that the electrophoresis is uh, authorized in these five cases, for example. That means differential diagnosis of acute and chronic inflammation, protein loss from different organs, then increased sedimentation rate, protein urea, or increased or decreased total protein. From the chapter endocrinology, diseases of hypothalamus and hy hypothesis were used, and from that group, only one parameter, as an example, is shown here, and ACTH is authorized for indication or for ordering in the differential diagnosis of hypercortisolism, diagnostics of adrenal cortex failure, or suspicion for ectopic ACTH secretion. The chapter hematology, from the blood count, one parameter, retic reticulocytes, and you see these five situations in which this parameter reticulocytes are authorized. The same case is from the subchapter coagulation in the parameter fibrinogen, which is authorized in this fibrinogenemia or hyperfibrinogenemia, liver disease, failure, blood loss, and so on. The chapter immunology, here is not the parameter, but the disease rheumatoid arthritis, and there are these parameters which are authorized in this case. The same is valid for the infection diseases. From the chapter infection diseases, one example, staphylococcal infections, is shown here, and you see that there are authorized, in that case, the cultivation of biological material, microscopy swaps, and hemocultivations. From the chapter extravasates, an example of cerebrospinal fluid was chosen, and you see we 
divide the investigation in the case of cerebrospinal fluid as a, an acute category, then the basic or routine uh, analysis, and some al also some some additional parameters. And as I said, molecular diagnostic is rather informative than and the people has to be be familiar with the techniques and with the syndromes and with the parameters. But as I said, it is quite strange to the vast majority of uh, physicians which are in the field clinical practice. Urgencies. As I mentioned, uh, this is maybe for you not very understandable, but these are parameters you see. The, as, as it was, the parameters of blood, parameters in urine, parameters in other kinds, for example, fertility, and these are here diseases according to the international list of diseases. And where are the crossing? So in this, in this disease, such, such, and such parameter, which is in the same column, is authorized. And it is prepared for all cases which uh, uh, and it, all these diagnoses are in such kind predefined. So that uh, were the results. So eight chapters and then the content and how the uh, rational use is made according to this monography. Now we used uh, at the end of the year 214 this knowledge or this book or this monography. Uh, how that could be a uh, function in the clinical practice and we make a very short retrospective pilot study where we studied materials from patients from one month and we evaluated 40,000 parameters in 10 most frequently ordered tests. And you see here the most frequently ordered parameters and the number and person and, and these, these are the parameters. These are the absolute numbers, and these are percentages of uh, the parameters which are not uh, authorized for ordering or not properly indicated. But it is only a retrospective study and administrative evaluation, so it uh, shows the potential, but uh, we are started a, a prospective study to be sure how that it functions. It will take six months and then that will be summarized after closing this study which started in January this year. Now the next step is reflection. The first question is how to approach or how to design or which is the philosophy and this is uh, of course a issue of great debate. Our experience is that it is impossible to make a uniform approach. And we use the definition of parameters and diseases and vice versa, and diseases and parameters in the chapters internal medicine and in chapters extra visits. So we have defined diseases, disease states or situation or circumstances, or in which the use of the parameter is authorized. And that means in diseases were used or, or defined uh, as a priority in endocrinology and infection diseases, in which uh, by each disease a laboratory parameter was uh, were defined which are authorized for use. And parameters as a priority were used in the chapters hematology and infection diseases and also some definition of rational use and accompanying comments and remarks has been has been added. As I mentioned previously, in the chapter Immunology and Allergology, it was a holistic approach where uh, rational ordering, definition of parameters, and also uh, definition of diseases as well as interpretation of parameters uh, was proposed. and. Uh, as I already stressed, the last chapter, molecular diagnostic, uh, represents more general information about how the parameters and techniques are used and technologies are used in the case of inherited diseases, tumors, and infections, which are the main fields of use of molecular 
and also some educational and explorative comments are, are added. So th this is to the approach of philosophy. Now, what is the rational use of laboratory test? First of all, it is a very delicate topic because the players involved or stakeholders have different goals or desires. Health insurance companies are interested in savings. Laboratories or laboratorians are interested in profit. And clinicians are interested, has acquired, have a, as little as possible complications. This is the real situation. On the other hand, uh, uh, the, the impact of uh, rational use, as we demonstrated in, our, in this December acid test study, and the potential of maybe 40% of uh, not authorized 40% tests, shows that it has, it has some impact on laboratory, on clinicians, on the patient, on health companies, and on politicians. So, uh, this uh, and, and all is uh, made in a, in a situation or in a context of lack of information, lack of time, and lack of money. So this pyramid, maybe, or this triangle, symbolizes very good the situation uh, or the, the the environment in which we are trying to find the answer to the question: What is the rational use of laboratory test? in fact, in the clinical practice or in general practice. Now, the question is uh, also how to use this monography as a command or as a recommendation. And uh, to that, concerning the recommendation, it is that each physician has his own or her own brain and uh, own thoughts on the one hand. On the other hand, each clinical case has a lot of similarities so there are some common rules which could be uh, common for the given cases. But uh, generally speaking, uh, the main characteristic is the quality of the cognitive frame of a given physician. And from that point of view, it is very relative uh, to, make, to, to answer the question, should it be used as a command or should it be used as a recommendation? Because it depends on the level of knowledge and experience of a given clinician. Now the context. It is very uh, easy to say this is good ordered or properly ordered or authorized or not uh, from the theoretical point of view or from the so-called, as we in Slovakia said, from the green table. But in, 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 in the field, in the front line, you are, as a physician, in very complex psychological situation. You are timely limited. You have a, a limited cognitive frame. Information you have now is not the same information you, you have had yesterday. And if you miss some parameter, there are some potential complications, which, which could be social complications. So it is not so easy in clinical practice to uh, adhere to all advices or recommendations in the monography. The goal, the goal of that two years process and of that monography was to find consensus between clinicians, between laboratorians, and also health insurance company or financiers. And we tried to do it in a author team and also in the two public public uh, panel discussions. But as you see, all behind is the money, which is very important in each case. Now, the monography is, of course, not perfect. And it will be not perfect. And it will never be perfect because the perfection means a sum of quality and actuality. And quality requires time for reading as much as possible of information or gaining. And actually, it is to get the information very quickly, at uh, just in time, or as soon as possible. And the solution is to try to finding the artful blend. And to that, you need the inspiration. But where do we get ours? In conclusion, the monography presented has four main orders. 
18 co-authors, 185 pages, and 331 clusters, elements, or items of uh, parameters or, or situations of authorized ordering in eight clinical fields. It represents a certain degree of consensus between clinicians, between laboratorians, and between financiers. And we, in a very short administrative retrospective study, studied 10 most frequently ordered parameters. And we, uh, the result is that approximately 40% of them are not justified or has been not justified. Perspectives. Based on provisional results during the year 215, the health insurance companies and the Department of Health are quite interested to use this monography. Maybe we do not know uh, as a national guideline or uh, as a guideline at national level. But I have to say that uh, the process of uh, writing or, or developing, and, and not only developing, this is one side, but to implementing uh, the developed uh, proposal in the clinical practice needs, first of all, to be strongly involved in clinics and uh, also, I mean, uh, politics in not the bad sense of the, uh, of the word, but the communication with people. I mean, it is not useful or, or, or not uh, important to have the scientific through, but uh, it is the preference is to achieve consensus. And of course, that all should be based on the laboratory and scientific background. So please, uh, I, I hope that you understand properly what I am saying to, to this. This is only the first step. And we have also ambition to write a book uh, about or develop a monography in which diseases will be defined and in which in each disease the parameters will be categorized in three categories. Parameters which must be ordered, parameters which should be ordered, and parameters which could be ordered. And of course, the proper interpretation should uh, be given that enables to the newcomers or the starter or the, uh, in, in the internal or uh, clinical medicine from the clinical sign or symptom through the laboratory results to the adequate diagnosis. And this is the book we have developed 20 years ago, fast 20 years ago. But the problem, and, and you see the, uh, the composition, so you see this example. This is in Slovak, but you see clearly that uh, the, uh, the one example diagnosis hypotorenal syndrome. Here is the, the name of the disease. Then here is the definition of the disease. And here is the end indication. The main parameters, the first category, which must be and which could be. And here you see the interpretation. But the problem was that uh, to summarize all these comments from maybe 22 authors uh, lasted three years. And after closing that process, after three years, the problem was that uh, the, the outcome was not actual. So we tried three times again. And, uh, you, and uh, maybe this year will, uh, will be probably succeeded, but uh, you never know the outcome. And at the end, I show you some references, which we also, or, or monographies, which we uh, have developed in, in this field during the last maybe 20, 30 years, and some publications in foreign journals and in national journals. So far, thank you very much, and uh, I'm ready to answer your, your questions if it will be from my side possible. Thank you very much, again. I was asking how you would ideally like to see the monograph used to change physician behavior. Would you like it distributed to all physicians, or can you foresee making the information about when the tests are appropriate available uh, when uh, physicians make orders electronically? This is an issue of discussion. Of course, we, uh, as, as I said, there is from the Department of Health and from insurance companies some interest to distribute it and to pay for it to distribute it to all physicians. 
the media, I would say that maybe electronically would be much more convenient for the clinical practice, but also the, also the paper format is not bad. But of course, the main step is to make seminars, regular seminars at clinics. I have not uh, time to describe that, but we did it during the 20 last years. And if you make these uh, seminars, and uh, it is a supportive step, but uh, you should do it regularly because if you stop with that, also the effect stops. Yes, I, I'm sure that's true. And uh, data, there's a lot of data from the U.S. which says really these interventions are, are most effective if you can bring them to, mar to bear exactly when the clinician is making the request. So, as you say, in an electronic form. We have a question from Dr. Kristin Vista, uh, who would like to know how you designed the study, that your uh, preliminary study, that showed 40% uh, of the tests were, were not justified. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, but that, that, that was approximately 1,200 patients from one month from physician offices. And we simply uh, retrospectively went it through with the uh, ordering physician and we studied this, uh, the material of the patient, and we discussed, we compared the diagnosis, and, and we compared the parameters which are authorized or not. And it took two weeks of very hard work to go through these materials, and this was the yeah. result. But uh, again, it, uh, that was retrospectively. It is a, a very short acid, so-called acid test, which uh, could maybe shows the tendency, but now we are uh, making a prospective study uh, at, uh, at the Department of Internal Medicine in our university hospital, and we uh, and all the clinic is involved. Each physician has this book, and we make uh, regular seminars about that, and uh, each month eva e make a discussion about this. So this will be much more in detail and much more reliable than this quick acid test. Okay, that sounds good. Are you able in that uh, in that study to address the problem of underutilization of clinicians not doing the tests they should be doing? I think there was a study from uh, Remy Arno in Boston in 2013, which shows that the rate of underutilization of testing of not doing the right tests is approximately twice the rate of clinicians doing the wrong tests. From my point of view. I, at this time, I'm not able to give you a valid comment or valid answer. Probably it is so, but we are not dealt uh, with the problem from that point of view. Because in, at least in our country, the pressure was uh, on, uh, to stop the overutilization, which seemingly uh, there is some kind. I'm sure that also the underutilization is a problem but we don't focus that problem. We are not aware of that problem, and it's a good point from the colleague, and we will also take this into account, of course. Okay, and the other thing, I suppose, is that, and the really difficult thing to do is to, in, your, in assessing rational use of laboratory medicine, is to try and get some outcome data. Uh, we very frequently do studies when we show uh, such uh, such and such uh, intervention reduces the number of tests, but without data on whether that makes the uh, patients better or worse or their condition is unchanged, we don't really have a, an absolute standard to to argue against. It may well be that driving down test numbers has an adverse effect on patient care. Yes, definitely, but. <laughs> I have, uh, from this time, uh, nothing to add. Really, you, okay. right. Well, uh, one uh, a question says, do you think the laboratory has a right to stop and simply not perform an, an, a test which is deemed unnecessary? Maybe in the such situation which the material, the biological material is damaged or so, but, uh, uh, you know, the ordering uh, physician is responsible for the patient so he is the boss and he has uh, in, in a given situation we can discuss with him thereafter but i don't think so that we can act uh, in a such commanding way 
Okay, I, I think that I think that varies from uh, we, we, uh, which setting uh, you're in. Certainly in the UK, we would think that we we have that right and we have a responsibility to to exercise it uh, where where a, a, a test is clearly in a, inappropriate. Yes, but uh, so far I know the so-called British culture or British approach or British laboratory medicine is quite different as in our country. That's true. Yes, it, 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 as I said, it, it does vary radically between between settings. May I answer these two questions on on, on the slide? Okay, please. Florent van Steppel asked: Rational ordering implies also rational availability. Uh, I do not understand what is the rational availability uh, properly. Aspect uh, of negotiation between stakeholders, how to sell benefit cost versus not necessarily realized expectation of the clinician. Could you explain, the, uh, could you ex uh, for example, uh, the promise uh, of improved TAT? Uh, mm, I do not understand properly the question. Uh, we are, uh, we, uh, uh, could could you could you could you spe uh, specify it more in detail? What do you, what do you mean that uh, this not necessarily realized expect expectation of the clinician? Florent can, is online, so perhaps he he, he could uh, add it. But um, I, I think he may be asking um, the overall sort of cost benefit ratio of doing a test versus the individual expectations of the clinician in an uh, individual case. So I, I think he's picking up on the point that you made earlier, that different stakeholders have different view of, of, of value, and therefore we need uh, to understand, get a common understanding of, of value. If, if, you imp if you use point-of-care testing to improve uh, turnaround time, then uh, where do, that costs the laboratory money, uh, but where where does the value uh, appear, and and do you get real real savings? Uh, but perhaps yes, I understand now. Uh, yes, I understand now, and uh, but this is uh, the not the uh, the real issue of rational use. It's a uh, an issue of money or of comfortability, because you know. It is, of course, very comfortable to make POCT at the bedside or home and so, but if it is ex more expensive, then you have to, uh, to, to pay money for this. But the parameter, is it order or is it not, this is not the real issue of rational use. It is an issue of how the, how the, how the parameter is used, but not, I, I mean, how the parameter is analyzed, bedside or in the laboratory. But this is not the real issue of uh, rational ordering, from my point of view, if uh, the question was meant in, 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 in that sense. Yeah, I, I've just seen a note from Florent, and I think that's what he, what he was get, uh, getting at. Sandra asks whether you expect large differences in percentages of unnecessary tests between... And I don't have the second part of that question, so... <laughs> Do you, do you expect there to be, be, uh, be large differences in the percentage of inappropriate tests between different users, perhaps, different clinicians? I would say uh, we made, but it, it was uh, 30 years ago, we made this study and we compared in our university laboratory the use, rational use of tests in of 22 departments. And there has been uh, differences between minus 35 from minus 35 to minus uh, to to minus 7 percent that uh, so it, this period was the the, the the difference between different departments in one hospital but uh, in broader sense I cannot answer this but according to our uh, experience I guess that it could be a difference between 220. 25% in, right. in this interval. Yeah, uh, th there's an old study by von Walraven in, in the literature which I think looked at uh, a 10 year uh, meta analysis of inappropriate testing and came out with rates that were between 4 and 96%, which I, 
I think shows the variability between different settings. Uh, Lena Korovskaya uh, from uh, St. Petersburg asks how we can communicate with the medical insurance companies that pay for tests. What, what's their role in this uh, debate? In our country, uh, the health insurance companies were the starter of that process two, uh, three years ago because the health insurance company gave out or, or issued a document uh, which defined the categories of physicians, of specialists, and of parameters which are authorized to do or not. And that was an, a disaster because that what was made from the health insurance company very administrative, and uh, there, are, there has been a lot of stupidities in, in, in this. So we uh, started to negotiate with that, and they said, please make your proposal. And that was uh, the starting point to write this monography. So we are uh, now quite closely collaborating with the health insurance companies, and this, uh, this monography is a prevention of uh, such uh, stupid tests which were, which were made three years ago. Okay, yeah, th th that sounds, uh, that's, uh, that's helpful, thank you. Have you done any work on um, the question of repeat intervals? How long a clinician should wait after having, after doing a test before it's legitimate to do, uh, do another test? Yes, uh, that is an issue we are also dealing with. It was not included, and but it is uh, very strongly demi demanded from the physicians as well as from the health insurance companies. Uh, but we are at this time not we have not not able to define the the, 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 the step and the intervals. But uh, definitely we will we, we should do that because this uh, this this factor influences very strongly the outcome, of course. Yeah, there is some work from the Royal College of Pathologists in the UK, which you can find on the UK College of Pathologists website, which does make an attempt on defining minimum retest intervals for a whole range of tests. And that, I think, is quite a helpful uh, start of a discussion. Thank you very much. We will definitely use this. I will ask after it. If you email me, I can, I can send you the reference. Um, Excellent. Vladimir Perishka uh, asks uh, what our experiences are with the possibility that the laboratory can add additional tests if we feel it's uh, important and, and whether we've seen an increase in the total number of tests or not. Um, certainly in the UK we have no difficulty with adding additional tests if we feel they're relevant or even substituting tests usually in discussion with the clinician. Although in the context of total numbers, Vladimir, I don't think I could say that there's a, a discernible I increase in, in testing. It, it's still fairly, fairly small numbers. Okay, we're coming up to six o'clock and I, I don't see any, any other questions. So I think oh, uh, at this point I'll thank uh, Gustav again for opening up the issues. As we've recognized, it, it's an extraordinarily difficult issue. But I think we, we all, as laboratory workers, need to recognize that if we get this right, if we um, really make an effort to improve the rational or, or, uh, utilization of laboratory testing, then we will improve patient outcomes. We will improve the value of laboratory medicine. We will save money for the people who, t who pay for the tests and will increase job satisfaction for all of us who work in laboratories. And all four of those are goals that are really worth working for. So I think it behoves every single one of us who work in laboratories to work actively towards making sure physicians have the information that they need to uh, use laboratory services effectively. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank Professor Kovac uh, on your behalf for an excellent uh, seminar and wish all of you a good evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dan, and bye.